everybody knows this is the Japanese society is aging and they do know that they need foreigners coming in to work. So with uh, visa, now it's easier, you know, comparing to, you know, years before. Highway, thanks for joining me today. Really appreciate you joining me today on the Borders podcast. Um, I reached out to you because I've been <laughs> contacting people <laughs> from pretty much every single country in Asia. So I've gone through Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. recently did Laos. Um, that's, that episode is going to come out today. And now sort of heading towards East Asia now, which I haven't really covered in too much detail. Um, and obviously you're based in Japan, so I'd love to hear about mm-hmm. you know your experiences and so forth. But maybe to start off with... Um, why don't you just give the audience a bit of an introduction to who you are and what you do? Yeah. Thank you, Sean, for having me today. So, um, yeah, and uh, my name is Wei, and a Taiwanese based in Tokyo, Japan. Um, so right now I'm working as a freelancer and running my own Thailand sourcing service type of thing. And I'm also running my own family. <laughs> I have I live with my husband and a two-year-old daughter. I am not exactly a housewife, but I do... Uh, kind of manage like the whole household stuff and my daughter's schedule like school school and like play days that type of stuff so kind of like a full-time mom but not full-time either and um so i've been in japan for about seven years i have always worked with startups um i used to organize um uh startup conferences like a big conference for about six thousand attendees but i also used to do smaller events, like come try to connect people in the kind of the startup community here in Japan. And I used to also do marketing for a crypto project. And now I am helping early stage startups and um, kind of try to help them attract more talents and hire more people cool. and grow their team. Sweet. Yeah. So you, man- you mentioned your talent source and so forth in terms of being able to, you know, match companies to talent um, in Japan. So we'll go into that a bit later um, in terms of, you know, being able to, you know, how to find a job in Japan and the best way for foreigners to be able to, you know, apply for jobs and so forth. But maybe to start off with, um, let's delve a bit more into your, you know, your, your background and life journey and so forth, which I always do. Um, so maybe to start off with, you know, you were born in Taiwan um, and then you moved to America and then you moved to Tokyo afterwards, Japan in Japan mm-hmm. or Tokyo, Japan. Okay. Um, <laughs> obviously, what other Tokyo? There's no other yeah. Tokyo, so not that I know of. But yeah, why don't you just bring us through that whole journey in terms of yeah, how how did you you know how do you make your way to Japan and why Japan of all places? Yeah, so first I moved to the US when I was 15. I did a high school exchange student program. So like I'm from Taiwan, but not from Taipei, not the capital, from a relatively smaller city. And growing up. I kind of watched a lot of TV. I watched like, you know, now K-pop and like K-drama is so popular, but I watched them like since I was probably like 10. <laughs> so like quite kind of early getting to like the Korean culture, drama and all that. I watched like one drama with like a lot of, uh, not a lot of but, like young Koreans um, studying in the US. And I thought, whoa, that's so cool. You know, I want to study abroad too. I was only like 11 or 12. So my mom thought I was just like, you know, me daydreaming and like not really serious. But um, finally, I convinced her that I was serious about this. And she agreed to let me do this one year program to the, in the U.S. So I was in Richmond, Indiana uh, for one year. I came back, went back to Taiwan. And I guess I was just there for like one year and a half like in high school. But then I... You know, even though I'm Taiwanese, but for me, it was still a little bit difficult to kind of fit in because I studied in the U.S. and then went back and like kind of, you know, really liked the school system there in the U.S. And in Taiwan, it's kind of it's not boring, but it is a lot of school work only, not so much of like, you know, sports or, you know, other activities. And my mom could see that I was not, you know, really having a good time. And then she asked me if I'd like to go uh, study in the U.S. again. So I did, um, went to, uh, I, I went to a community college in Seattle for about a year. And in Seattle, I lived in kind of like the gay district. And I was like really fascinated learning like this new, like new culture to me. 
And uh, I observe people a lot on the street, like how they dress and things like that. I got interested in fashion and then moved to New York and studied um, at a fashion school. And life in New York was great, you know, so diverse. I got to meet a lot of people from, you know, different countries and I, I really loved it. But the reality is that New York is so expensive. And in the end, I just couldn't afford it anymore. You know, as an international student, I really wasn't able to work and uh, get paid properly. So, um, you know, I started looking looking at other options, thinking about maybe moving to other cities in the U.S. But then to me, New York really was the best. Like I couldn't find anywhere else like better than New York in the U.S. And I thought, OK, now maybe it's time to look outside of the U.S. And then I I took Japanese when I was in college, you know, kind of to uh, fulfill the uh, requirement to do foreign language. And uh, I was really interested in studying more. Plus, I lived in like kind of the Japanese neighborhood. Well, not Japanese neighborhood, but like this area called uh, East Village in New York City, where um, they have a lot of Japanese restaurants, hair salons, uh, Japanese shops, things like that. So I thought, you know, it probably wouldn't be that difficult to like you know get used to life in Japan since I'm always shopping at those like Japanese shops so I looked into schools there so if I go to a Japanese university I probably have to redo university again I didn't really want that I found so I found a university that's you know American university but with a campus in Tokyo so I found out about that school and I applied to uh, scholarships I got the scholarship and you know everything kind of was like easy and got a scholarship and like it, it was it's definitely really helpful and uh and as an international student in japan i found out that i i can work 28 hours a week so it sounds sound like a much better deal so i i moved so it's kind of like you know just uh at first it was um really just due to financial reasons couldn't really survive in new york anymore and thought japan was the easier option but I did not really like the culture and like um, really just people here and like the language, food and everything. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting story about how you sort of um, made your way to Japan after all that time. Uh, was there anything about Japan specifically that attracted you? I mean, it seems like you obviously you love New York. Um, you took up you only took up Japanese, I think, quite later in life, that sort of thing. So what made you yeah. decide to, you know, stay in the end? So in the end, well, so actually comparing to the U.S. in Japan, at first I thought this is like an easy option. Like I, I right, like I knew a little bit of the language and I felt like, you know, Japan and Taiwan are so close. It wouldn't be hard for me to fit in. And, you know, I kind of look Japanese, speak a little bit of the language. But in reality, it's still there are a lot of challenges for foreigners. And, and I feel like I am always attracted to challenges. And I want to... You know, you know, it was difficult, but I wanted to stay and see if I can make things better for myself. So, so yeah, so like for me, it was at first, you know, um, as a foreigner, finding a job was difficult without knowing Japanese and speaking like business Japanese. But then I thought, you know, I still want to be able to work here. I still want to be able to see um, if there are other options for me. So, so yeah, I kind of stayed because I feel like there are a lot that I can do because things are so difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make no, any sense. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. Having that, I think part of that is that challenge, being able to overcome those challenges and being able to, I guess, prove to yourself um, that, you know, you can overcome, you know, a lot of these perceptions and um, I guess, yeah, another way to put it, challenges that exist for foreigners so why don't we go into that now? Why don't we just talk about a little bit about, obviously language is a huge thing, but mm -hmm. um, I think from a, I wanted to get the perspective because you're Asian, right? You're an Asian foreigner in mm -hmm. Japan. I'm just wondering, you know, what, what are the challenges you think from your perspective um, of being in Japan is? Being an Asian foreigner here sometimes is like, it's good because you fit in really well, like just the look <laughs> and we kind of blend in and um, until pretty much until I open my mouth that people, will, that's the only time people would know, oh, you're probably not Japanese or maybe you are Japanese, but you are perhaps Kikoku Shijo, meaning like you're Japanese, but you grow up overseas. So, so yeah, so I feel like sometimes I, if I just don't open my mouth or 
you know, I can just easily put it on Japanese and I, I, I won't stand out. And, you know, things are easy sometimes because, you know, uh, for foreigners that are perhaps, you know, white or like from other countries that you look obvious, not Japanese, things can be a little more difficult for them. You know, in Japan, even though it's a very, it's a country known, like people are known for being very polite and nice, but the reality is if you're a foreigner here and you look don't you don't look like Japanese, police on the street can easily, you know, ID you and ask you questions and they don't really need to have any legitimate reasons. So we do have that kind of problems here. But for me as an Asian <laughs> looking like looking Japanese looking type of Asian Asian, like I, I don't usually have these type of problems and um fit in really well but still it's like it's just a surface right like beneath the surface i'm still a foreigner so it's still a lot of like cultural differences that i need to navigate mm, gotcha and what do you think yeah. when you first came to japan and even still now what do you think the major cultural barriers are for you know foreigners like yourself yeah so um in terms of i think language is the is the first thing not just because you know it's a new language to learn but in japanese you know they have the super polite form, the polite form, the casual and everything. So it's like a very clear, there's a very clear division um, in the hierarchy system. You know, like this is how you would speak to your client. This is how you speak with somebody that's older. So like that's the most difficult thing for me because we don't really have that in Chinese or at least, you know, how we speak in Taiwan. So that's the first thing. It was kind of difficult because, you know, I came here and I started working but then to them in business, that's important. You always need to know how to treat your clients and, or, or how to speak in a business meeting, things like that. So, so yeah, I would say that's the, the first thing is the language kind of barrier, but not just because you need to relearn a language and uh, cultural differences. I, I would say in Taiwan, uh, most people are very outspoken and, um, Sometimes it will make things a little bit awkward here because in Japan, you know, they they always try to. I don't um I don't know if it's right to say they always try to be polite, but I would say they always try to do the right thing and you know try to say the right thing. So um sometimes they will feel like you know maybe they shouldn't really talk about what they really think, and that you know can make it difficult for us to communicate sometimes so i think that's a little bit of the cultural differences that we have yeah. and um and yeah i can make things a little awkward but japanese are also very forgiving so i mean oh maybe because you're a foreigner that's okay but but yeah but like this is this is the um probably one of major differences gotcha that we have. and the other part i wanted to cover was actually um i think Jap japan Rightly or wrongly, I don't know, has a reputation. Obviously, we've, we've talked about, you know, it's got a bit of a monoculture, like it's very hard to fit in in some regards. Um, the second bit is actually the point about being a female in the workplace. Like I think the traditional structure has always been, you know, the female, you know, stays at home and looks after the kids. So how, how does that, how do you see that as a, I guess, a female in the country? Do you face any of those challenges or not really? Yeah, I definitely do. And um, before I, I, I kind of feel like, you know, since I'm a foreigner, maybe I won't face that much like struggle as a woman here. But in reality is that I, so I, um, I got pregnant and I had a job, but unfortunately, you know, as most startup most startups failed. My the company that I used to work for also <laughs> kind of failed, and then everybody was let go. So I was 28. Uh, week pregnant I when I lost my job and you know I thought you know it would be fine you know I'm a foreigner I have like certain skills I should be able to find a job very quickly and I did got I did I did um, get a lot of interviews like seven or eight like really good number to, to be honest I thought you know I have so many interviews lined up I, I'm talking to all these companies I should be fine but then um, you know that was before COVID so most interviews are in person I went into the interviews and everybody was like, why are you even here? Like you have this big belly, you're pregnant, obviously. Like, why are you looking for work? So I explained to them, I lost my job and I really need a job. But everybody in the end just like started telling me how hard it is to, to work while having a young child. So I was like, 
oh, okay, so now I'm facing that, you know, <laughs> I thought it was just like a story, but then now it's my reality, right? You know, as a woman trying to, um, I guess, work, but then, you know, everybody's kind of like not turning me down, but then trying to, you know, not really doing this interview be- but with me, but then telling me how hard things are. So like, to me, it was like, kind of, I felt defeated in a way, like, you know, feeling this impossible for me to, to continue working, you know, not, you know, not until my daughter is older. And when I was working uh, in my previous company, I was hiring, doing hiring as well. And I talked to a lot of uh, candidates that are women, uh, either uh, married or married with uh, children. They were really surprised that I reached out to them. They were like, is this like for real? This job seemed to be too good to, to be true, you know, because they were like, you know, how come I have a young child and I can still work and they all work remotely and get get paid like every minute that I work. And, you know, they just couldn't believe it. And I felt like in Japan, because like the culture, I would say like the traditional corporations still are pretty outdated. You know, they are like still thinking that, um, they will still actually ask you if you're, if you're married or not in an interview, which is like pretty inappropriate, but they do that because they will still have concerns for women that are married, you know, that the person can really work long-term. So there are still definitely a lot of barriers for women and I really want to change that. So uh, when I reach out to people, I, I make sure that, you know, they, they know that this won't be a problem. And uh, now I'm working with a lot of uh, companies. I want to, you know, not just help them to source talents, but also learn like what they're thinking when they hire. And hopefully uh, through working with me, they will know, because they my, all my clients know that I have a young child. I want to, you know, do my best and show them that, you know, women with young children, you know, we can do this, it's all good. And, you know, gradually change the culture because I, I definitely see a lot of barriers for women uh, yeah. working in Japan. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I, it's kind of a long yeah. answer. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I totally get it. I think, yeah, obviously it's something you're passionate about because you face certain struggles as a as a parent and, you know, being able to find a job is very difficult. I think it's also, I don't think it's actually a Japanese problem as well. Like even in Australia, you still hear cases, not probably not as bad, but cases mm. where, you know, if you're pregnant and go to an interview, you'd probably be, you know, sort of um, not hired. <laughs> they won't yeah. say it to you, but, you know, this that perception, I guess, of, um, you know, they're worried that, you know, you won't, you know, be at you know, your full attention to the job so yeah it really depends on the company really depends on the culture so i think a lot of that's changing but yeah maybe it'll take some time um i guess maybe to move on to next so we talked a bit about we haven't really talked about your career so far so maybe, why don't you just talk us through that and maybe mm-hmm. to lead up to that also how you managed to find you know your first job in japan yeah so i came here uh, after I finished my master's degree, but um, before, so I did my master's in the UK, and before I moved to the UK for uh, for the for grad school, I lived in Japan and studied at a university here, right, for about a year. So I did um, kind of already know people here, and I, when I was in uh, university, I worked for this uh, organization called Slush, which uh, they organize startup events and things like that. So. Um, when I was still in grad school, I decided I want to move back here. And I re- just reached out to them and asking them, you know, if there's anything I can help and hopefully <laughs> that will lead to a job after graduation. And it did. So I continued working for them after I finished my uh, master's degree. So um, working uh, for like events is really good sometimes because that means that you are reaching out to a lot of people, a lot of networking opportunities. So, so yeah, so I got to know a lot of people in the startup community here and uh for that uh organization it's usually like a one-year thing because you know the event is only once a year so after you finish the event that year usually most people move on and work on other projects or you know work on go uh accept a new job things like that so um for me too like naturally i was looking for a new job after that year's event was uh finished and uh, for me, I was on a lot of job sites too, like LinkedIn and a Japanese uh, website called Wantedly. To be honest, like sometimes for a foreigner without much professional uh, experience, looking for jobs on this type of site 
can be a little difficult because uh, in general, people looking there, they want someone who is already experienced. So for me, I didn't really have a lot of luck back then through job searching sites. But, um, but because the event uh, slash the organization I worked for, I got to know a lot of people. So then in the end, I started reaching out to people that I know through the event. And that's how I uh, got a lot of job interviews lined up and start talking to a lot of companies. But you know, startups sometimes they don't they don't hire all the time. And they when they hire, they want specific talent. So a lot of time it's just like just conversation. But still, it's good to you know network with people and get to know what they do. Uh, long story short, but I uh, um, that year because I did a lot of uh, topics on cryptocurrency and blockchain, I ended up getting a job on. Um, at a uh, crypto project. So that's the um, one that I mentioned that I did uh, marketing for. And yeah, so even though I didn't have a lot of experience with marketing, but you know, back then crypto um, advertisements were, were not like now, you know, you can you know, watch Super Bowl and then you see uh, advertisements from Coinbase. It wasn't like that back then. So usually with um, marketing, it was a lot of community um type of like uh, marketing you know you know like you would be on social media talking to people or you do offline online events that type of thing so that kind of was a good opportunity for me to kind of dive in the to dive in the crypto space so yeah so i was doing that for about almost two years but but yeah i did lost my job and as i mentioned really unfortunately but, but yeah, but I took a year off and finally was able to, you know, I got connected with somebody on LinkedIn and then he said, Hey, I know this company, they are helping startup hire and since your background, you know, you, you, you know, a lot of startup companies. So this could be, you know, something that you're interested in. And I say, yeah, definitely. So I talked to the founder and she is a female entrepreneur and she definitely, um, wants to support other women um more working mothers so yeah we had a chat and i got the job working for her and sh her um startup is is all about you know empower empowering women and you know not just working mother but also artists so you know people who are working as a freelancer so at the time it was like it worked out perfect for me so I worked for her company for about a year and really got to learn more about the recruitment industry. And uh, in the end, I quit actually, but it wasn't because I wasn't happy there. It was just because, you know, as a foreigner here, my family in Taiwan, my husband's family in the U.S., I kind of need a lot more flexibility than I than probably average people. And so, yeah, and with when you work for a company, a lot of time it's about you know, it's, it's teamwork, you're not working individually. So, but then um, I, I kind of needed to take a lot of time off for family. So I decided that, you know, I, I, I kind of ha had to quit that job, even though I was really happy with that job. And I quit, uh, now I started working as a freelancer. Hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. And in terms of like you work as a freelancer, just to explain that for the audience. So what you do is help startups find talent. Is that essentially how you what you do yeah it's actually really simple like i don't i don't even call myself recruiter because i you know we're recruiting like the 360 degree they can't do a lot actually but for me i really just i i do search on linkedin so linkedin is my primary tour i search for talents on linkedin and i build this show list for my clients you know i also reach out to candidates and i ask them if they, if they are interested in the job if they're interested, I get their uh, CV and I send their CV straight to my client and I, I kind of give them like a summary about the candidate and they decide if, if they want to meet him or her. And really that's, 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 that's it. You know, after that, they take over completely. So yeah, so I'm not really working as a recruiter. So, um, so yeah, I call my service Thailand Sourcing. And yeah, I mostly worked with early stage startups and, uh, it worked really well for me because, you know, like they're not hiring all the time and I am also not working all the time. <laughs> so it, it's like a perfect match for me. Like I feel like I get to work anytime I want and 
support them, you know, really based on their needs. Because to be honest, the recruitment industry, you know, agencies or any type of um, other recruitment services, there's really not one that is truly catering to startup companies because, you know, it is very unique because they, you know, first of all, they don't usually have a lot of money to, to invest in hiring, but they need to hire. Otherwise they can't grow. Right. Mm. So, so yeah. So I feel like my service is to them, um, based on what they say, I don't, I, I don't want to say that, you know, I'm helping them a lot, but you know, from my yeah. uh, feedback from my client that they, they do think this is very helpful for them. What I'm do offering. You, do you reach out to like people based in Japan already? Or is there times you would reach out to a foreigner? Like how do you like approach people mm -hmm. or approach talents? Yeah. So right now, uh, the clients that I have, they do prefer people that are here already because, because of visa. So I was talking to this one client, they were telling me that, you know, they can definitely sub out to a visa. I think any company, uh, here in Japan can, it's just that the process is very long, you know, it can be six months and they well, when it comes to startup companies, when they need someone, they really want somebody to be on board like right away so right now unfortunately my clients they are all looking for people who are already here but i would say you know before covid um people can you know get job easier you know in japan even if they are abroad but right now since the uh, visa restriction sometimes it can be a little a little hard right now but mm. but i would say after covid everything probably will be back to normal and you know, my clients probably will be more open to hire people from overseas. Because yeah. to be honest, a lot of time, um, I ha my clients are hiring engineers and the engineering talent pool here in Japan is relatively small. So they do feel like they have to hire from overseas. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So obviously, yeah, if you're in an in-demand industry like software engineering or developer, obviously it'll be a bit easier, but anyway, we'll, we'll get into that a bit later, but maybe yeah. to start off with now that we'll now we're just starting to talk about, you know, getting a job in Japan and so forth. And we've talked about a bit about your history. Uh, what would you, what would be your advice for someone who is looking for a job in Japan currently, who's based overseas? Obviously we've talked about the power of networking and, you know, how you succeeded in your, you know, your path in securing a job. But yeah, is there anything else you would recommend for foreigners? Yeah. Like first uh, advice, definitely to be creative, you know, because sometimes I, I feel like, especially for um, new graduates, sometimes I feel like even though we're foreigner, they still kind of feel um, there's a need for them to do like the traditional Japanese job hunting, like the new graduates here. But then there's not really that need, I feel like, even though even though um, that's how most people would do it here, you know, how Japanese would do it. You know, as a foreigner, I would encourage everybody to be creative. You know, even if you are a new grad, I would still, even though LinkedIn and, you know, other job sites didn't really work out for me when I was a new graduate, but, you know, I would encourage people to still go on those type of sites. And um, also other, other than that, networking, as I mentioned, is a really good, way to find jobs here and yeah there are a lot of different ways and for for me a lot of time i feel like people have difficulty trying to find a job is that they feel like they have to do it the japanese way but you know it's about foreigner we can we can try different we can do it differently for yeah. sure i think the other big thing we've touched upon before um is also language barrier so say if a foreigner doesn't speak japanese that well mm -hmm. um what is the best way for them to approach it? Because I think if you look at a lot of sites on LinkedIn or, or Wantedly or whatever it is, they'll probably say um, for you to be, they will prefer you to have uh, Japanese proficiency at a professional or fluent level. So yeah, what's your advice for those who don't speak English that well? What sort of jobs are available? Yeah, so in terms of like industry, so I mean, we talked a lot about engineering uh, roles, you know, a lot of time, these type of roles, they don't require Japanese skills. But also, for example, um, companies that are in the tourism industry, they don't usually require dropping uh, skills as well, you know, because they want to be able to support their foreign clients, things like that, um, people like that. And another thing is that, you know, we can always look at, you know, what kind of companies and um, they are trying to expand abroad because, 
as Japanese company, they feel like they don't know the culture that well, you know, whichever country they are trying to expand to. So they want to hire foreigners that can kind of help them to, to, to expand. So yeah, so like definitely look, um, to see what company is considering expanding, you know, watch a lot. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think people still watch news, but read news online <laughs> probably is a good way to, to learn about this type of information. Cause you know, a lot of time we do feel like without the Japanese, uh, Japanese ability is kind of limiting our options, but then, um, it is, it really requires us to do research to know what's going on in the industry and then you know it will help us find a job yeah, yeah i think that's a great idea just um obviously doing your research figuring out which companies are open to you know foreigners and their skill set so forth so obviously you got to do a bit of work to figure that out and obviously a lot of networking um actually uh, one question i had was in regards to i think english teaching is one um thing we haven't mentioned but obviously a popular way of getting into the country have you seen many people make that transition from English teacher to something else? That's actually true. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, they, they did start with English teaching and then switch to something else later on. So now there are a lot of like definitely uh, resources. For example, a lot of coding boot camps here. So I do see a lot of people, they, they first uh, start out English teaching, but then they they uh, also go to this boot camp, coding boot camp later. And then, you know, they require new skills and they, they can kind of like have this transition to other career paths. So I, I, I see that a lot, you know, that's the popular option for people and usually um, kind of allows them to have a kind of career jump too, right? Cause you know, if you work as a engineer, usually better pay, things like that. So that's one popular uh, option and also Recruitment is a popular one too. Usually in this industry, you don't need that much of Japanese skill. And, and yeah, so I definitely think it's a good, good way to kind of start your career in Japan. And once you're here, you know, you already have a visa. So it's easier for you to be hired to by other companies. So the company can, can, you know, they don't have to worry about all the paperwork and you can start working right away. So, so yeah, so even though it, Sometimes people might might not prefer to start with that, but I was I would say that you know if you didn't really know you don't really know what to do to start, that is a good way. In regards to the recruitment industry, so say you said that foreigners can um, they don't need as much Japanese for those sort of roles. Why is that? I thought do you need to assess the candidate's ability to like speak Japanese, or is it more about finding the right people and then letting the company figure it out afterwards? Yeah, I think a lot of the jobs uh, require bilingual candidates. That's why, because like you say, you know, some jobs, you know, you, like if you're reading a Japanese resume, you don't have the uh, ability to mm. read that. It is impossible. But what happens is that nowadays, definitely, um, there are more jobs that require candidates to know at least conversational English. So uh, the recruiters, what they do is that they can do the initial interview in English mm -hmm. for their clients and you know if that actually uh worked out you know like the, the candidate can speak English for the client that's like you're doing that English assessment for them gotcha. so okay. yeah so that's why so you're not really just doing the initial interview you're also assessing the candidate's English skills so yes and usually even if the the job doesn't require that much of English but for the clients it's good for them to know okay this 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 candidate can understand what, are, what uh, the recruiter is talking about, mm. things like that. So, yeah. Gotcha. And I know we talked a lot about startups and well, I'll come back to it, but I'm wondering for people in like sort of mid-professional careers that are looking to work for a big corporation in Japan, mm -hmm. um, say, I don't know, like a Mitsui Furosan or something, is it much harder? Do you have to, is it more traditional? Is it much harder to get in through that like traditional, like old school company? Yeah, I mean, to me personally, I think it is more difficult because, you know, traditional companies, usually they have their own way of doing things. So if you you want to work for this type of companies, you, you probably need to learn more and talk to people, you know, working at that company probably would be the easiest way. So, so yeah, so I was still, but you know, it's the same thing, right? Cause if you want to know people from that company, you, you still need to network. And nowadays, you know, you have LinkedIn and it's really easy to find people working for the company you want to work for. So I would really encourage people to utilize 
those tools that are available. And for foreign talents, definitely uh, LinkedIn is the first source recruiter use because, you know, there are a lot of other job searching sites, but they are still pretty Japanese. You know, you, you will probably get candidates that only speak Japanese there. So recruiters, when they have the need uh, to find ta uh, talents that speak English or other languages, they go on LinkedIn. So for people, even, you know, you want to work for big corporations, I, I would say still, you know, use use LinkedIn and, you know, you can get connected to people or you can, um, you know, find out what's there, you know, they are available. Gotcha. And let's talk a little bit about visa options as well. So mm -hmm. off the top of my head, like the easiest one for Australians that I know is probably like a working holiday visa. I know that's not available to a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. I, I was surprised to find that the US doesn't have that agreement with um, Japan for some reason. But yeah, for Australians, if you get... I think six months, but the ability to extend to 12 to 18 months on a work flight to come to Japan and do a hot, like you can work and also holiday at the same time. It allows mm -hmm. you that flexibility. Um, but in terms of other people who don't have those options, what, what, what other visas are available to them? Yeah. So working holiday is also very popular for Taiwanese because we, you know, luckily also have that agreement. So a lot of people do apply for that. And for countries that don't have the agreement, I would say, you know, there are, so I have this one friend who, who is from the UK, but he speaks Japanese and he started doing a lot of like translation work when back when he was still living in the UK. And at a point that he got a lot of clients and he um, was able to kind of make an income that's like equivalent to somebody here in Japan working full time. So um, what he did was that he kind of get all the contract he, he has he, uh, with his clients and he put together like kind of like a portfolio, things like that, you know, proving to the Japanese government that he has enough work here to do. And he was able to get a work visa in Japan like that. So I would say like, even if, you know, you are, you are overseas, but you already have some connection here, you can apply to work visa yourself without a specific or a single company sponsoring you. So that's one option, you know, working as a freelancer, you can still get a work visa like that. And uh, with other work visa, pretty much any company here can sponsor. So, so yeah, so like if you find a company that are willing to hire you, you can apply to uh, work, work visa overseas. That's not that difficult, you know, comparing to other countries. And, uh, and yeah, so, English teaching is one, so there's this uh, JET program a lot of people do, right? Teaching English and get a visa here. And once you have, pretty much once you have any type of visa, you can easily change to a longer term work visa. So in Japan, the work visa is like one year, three year, five years. But, you know, how many years you get really depends on what kind of companies you work for and maybe also like where you're from. So like I can say for sure if like what, what, um, you can get like a five-year visa long-term because, you know, like wh whatever reason, because it really depends on immigration. And for me, I uh, had a work visa uh, and uh, I later switched to highly skilled or well, professional visa. I think that's what they call. So Kodo Jinzai visa in Japanese. So I didn't really know much about it, but I heard from, you know, other foreigners living in Japan. They said like this type of visa it's better in a way that you can get permanent residency faster in Japan. So the requirement, uh, the requirements were, well, there are actually there's this uh, point system that they do. So once you has um, seventy, uh, the score of seventy, you can apply to highly skilled work visa. So how they do this point system is that they look at your uh, your age. So the younger you are, the more point you get and your uh, educational level. So PhD, obviously you get more points and then master bachelor. And also your salary level, the higher salary you have, the, the higher points you get. And if you uh, went to like a top 100 university in the world, you also get like an extra 10 point sign like that. So that's how they do this point system. And if you check the, the chart and you can have, you know, 70 or 80, you can apply for highly skilled work visa. So the the difference between 70 and 80 is that if you have 
70, you will be able to apply for permanent residency after three years. But if you have 80, you can do that after just one year. So uh, I was really lucky with the job that I had for the crypto project, you know, because it's, I guess because it's a crypto project, I was paid pretty well. So I was eligible to, uh, to get the highly skilled professional visa. And after one year, I applied to permanent residency and, and I did get it. So now I'm a permanent resident here uh, by visa. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, it's great. It sounds like, um, would you say that Japan is, is easier to get, you know, work and a visa in Japan now? Do you think they're more open to foreigners coming in? Yeah, I think so. Because, you know, everybody knows this is the Japanese society is aging and they do know that they need foreigners coming in to work. So with uh, visa, now it's easier, you know, comparing to, you know, years before, you know, my, I, my mom has uh, a friend who has been in Japan forever and she was really surprised that I could get permanent residency so quickly because in the past it's like impossible. And uh, even now for um, a regular work visa, you need to be here for 10 years, but now we have these other options too, right? So I would, you know, and uh, visa policies, this type of thing, like they change pretty quickly. So, you know, as a foreigner, we kind of, if you, you know, if you really want to be here long term and feel like your know, permanent residency, you want to get, or, or, um, you know, that's your goal. Definitely make sure to follow this information. And they, I feel like the government really do want to uh, attract people. So, so yeah, so there are always a lot of opportunities here. And getting a work visa is not as hard as before. So, you know, even for freelancer. And so, yeah, so actually going back to the topic, you know, finding a job here, you know, if you really, you know, have difficulty and but you want to stay here, you know, translation work, you know, find you do as a freelancer and you can show the government that you're making enough money. That's also a way for you to to stay here. So, yeah, so be creative, you know, even as a freelancer, there's a way to stay. No problem. And I feel like, yeah, let's, uh, let's not think that is hard just because, you know, the Japanese ability might not be as, na you know, the native speakers. Yeah. So, yeah, I see a few ways, I see a few ways of getting into Japan. Again, it will require a bit of work. So obviously we mentioned, you know, English teaching first and then try to switch over. Um, obviously as a freelancer, you're making enough money. You can obviously apply for like a freelancing visa. Um, uh, software like in demand industries like software engineering where you don't need too much English that's another option or finding a company mm -hmm. which you know requires you know a bit of international experience so like a tourism company and so forth so there are a few options there I think you just need to be mm -hmm. a bit creative as you said like you know show showcase a portfolio or what you've done in the past and yeah hope and you know, hope for the best but yeah it just requires a bit of um obviously a bit of luck but also a bit of um a bit of work on your side as well so now nah, th thanks for that in regards to other like, ways to get into Japan, maybe for younger people, um, do you know much about the scholarship um, options there are? Because I, I mentioned, I think you mm -hmm. came to Japan initially on a scholarship. Is that right? Yeah, I came on a scholarship, but for me, it wasn't a government scholarship. It was like directly from the school. Mm -hmm. And I do know um, for like, I guess public universities and private universities, even they do have scholarship, like kind of some sort of agreement with the government. So I, I do have friends that were on like full scholarship studying here uh, for university. So, so yeah, definitely check the website and talk to embassies. Usually this type of information that, you know, you'll get from the embassy and they will have, you know, a uh, very clear instruction telling you how to apply. But the thing is with Jap with everything to do in Japan, they like you to apply like sometimes normally uh, a year in advance. So yeah, so you need to kind of um, start prepared early. That's what uh, I would suggest. Cause you know, like even, so now my daughter is two for daycare and all that, you know, they start, the year start in April, but by, October, I think you need to apply. So everything here is like that. So you need to definitely prepare early. So if you're coming next year, now is probably already a good time to start looking into this type of option. So yeah, definitely talk to embassies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think I mentioned to you before that I did a scholar. I got a scholarship to Taiwan, and it's actually one of yeah. the easiest ones to do. I've looked at the other countries. <laughs> um, 
Because normally countries require you to be, I think Japan probably one of the hardest ones. Like you got to have, if you want to come in on a scholarship, you got to be studying like a PhD or、um, something like that. There are other ones like you can do during university. So, but if you're not in university, tough luck. It's a bit harder. But、um, yeah. yeah, and like even countries like China, if you want to go into China for scholarship, obviously very hard now because they're locked down. But you need to pass like a test, like of, like your Chinese ability. Whereas in Taiwan, it was pretty much eighteen to thirty five. Uh, and you're in, so <laughs> yeah, no, it, was, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that easy.、Come. Yeah, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's. I think out of all the ones I've seen so far, Taiwan's probably one of the easiest ones to get for those who are listening.、Mm. Um, if you are interested in heading over to Asia, so um, that's one option. Um, but yeah, I think we've covered pretty much everything about um trying to get a job in Japan, right? Is there anything else? Um, I can't remember if there's anything else that we've got to mention. I think we've talked about pretty much everything, right? Yeah, pretty much everything. And in terms of Taiwan, maybe there's one thing I can add. So I didn't know about this, but one、uh, one of my friends, he's American, and he shared on, I think, LinkedIn or like Facebook. Anyway, some sort of social media that there's this this thing called Taiwan Gold Card. So pretty much、mm, yeah. anybody, like you were saying, like can apply for this, and they,、uh, you know, they don't really have to have like a clear like. Plans in terms of like you know what they want to do, but then you know if you want to move to Taiwan to work, this is a very good、um, option too. You know, Taiwan Gold Card allows you to to move to Taiwan and work for I think one year, or you can extend. I don't really know the details, but、yeah. uh, I checked a little bit. But yeah, it does it does seem like it's very easy for people to apply if you know, you are a prof- young professional, or is there? A, Age limit. I actually, don't, I'm not sure. I think there is. Yeah, I can't remember what the requirements are. I guess it's pretty. I think it's pretty generous、yeah. compared to other countries. I think it's one to five years, depending on your experience. I see.、Uh, maybe initially one year, and then you can extend. But yeah, it depends on your、yeah. what sector you're in, what field you're in. But yeah, it's not that defined. No, it's not that like well defined. So I think it's pretty generous, from what I can tell. So.、Um, And I just guess、uh, we talked a little bit about university as well, like you attended university and so forth. Do you think there's any point? Say you are looking to get over to Japan. Do you think attend like doing a second degree would help in you know securing a job? Is that a recommended path, or it's just a, a longer path? Yeah, <laughs> I mean personally, I feel like yeah, it could be a longer because you're you know a student over again. But it is definitely. Positive to do a degree here because you know the companies here would know your you know you know you know the you know see you go to like you know if you go to like the the good ones I suppose like for example for my for me so I went to Cambridge for grad school but even Cambridge is like. It, it it seemed to me that it doesn't really mean a thing to them, <laughs>、mm-hmm. but if you go to like Tohei Tokyo University or even private universities like Waseda or Sofia University, you're like they will be like, oh, that's a really good university. <laughs> like foreign university, they are just like, okay, yeah, you you you're from abroad. <laughs>、mm-hmm. And you know when I was applying for the highly、uh, skilled professional visa, you know I was like, oh, so I went to Cambridge, I can get the extra ten points. And my visa consultant was that, yeah, let me look it up. <laughs> I was like, why do you need to look it up? It's obvious one of the top hundred universities. But but yeah, so like people here in general, they might heard of your university, but then they still they don't feel like they're familiar with foreign universities. So it's beneficial to do a degree here, and when you go into job interviews, and your your potential employers would know like this university、yeah. you have gone to, and as a foreigner, they feel like. Uh, you might know Japanese、uh, culture better because you studied here. Gotcha. Yeah.、Cool. And in terms of、uh, going on about jobs again, in terms of startups in Japan, like obviously you've been involved、um, in that sort of field in in like Tokyo, for example. What what do you see in the startup ecosystem at the moment? Like, are they are they quite active or are things slowing down? Like, what are your thoughts in general about the startup ecosystem in in Japan? I definitely think it's more active than ever, even with COVID, and that's because because、um, now everything is online. So startups here, they feel like they can easily talk to anybody, anywhere, like investors or other、uh, you know companies that can put, they can potentially collaborate. So so yeah, so even with COVID, because everything is online, there are 
even more opportunities for startup companies. And the startup ecosystem, you know, even though Japan can be traditional and all that, but, you know, it's, the startup community here is very international because they know, you know, for certain jobs, they, they want to hire foreigners and they're willing to. And also, um, uh, they are like actually a startup visa as well. So the ja uh, not Japanese, but uh, Shibuya, -ku, Shibuya Award, they had this startup visa. They want to attract more foreigners, more entrepreneurs to to uh, kind of build their company here. So yeah, so it's been very very active, and I feel like it'll only be be more because you know people. Here, I feel like even Japanese, they, they see the need, right, to change and to be more innovative. And usually starting your company is a good way to do that. Um, as we start wrapping up, maybe um, to ask a few personal questions, um, you know, about your time in Japan so far. Like, what do you like most about living in Japan, say, compared to the other countries you've been in so far? Yeah, I definitely like how uh, convenient uh, Tokyo is. You know, the trend can take me anywhere and I can, you know, shop pretty much any time for food <laughs> and eating all the time. So like, it's really important for me, like I can go to a convenience store, like, you know, any time during the day and I can get anything I want, you know, make coffee, skin, any documents at a convenience store. So yeah, so for me, it's really the convenience here um, that, you know, it kind of make me like the city so much and also um, how safe it is. You know, Japan is relatively safe and I have a young child here. So safety is definitely very important for me. So, yeah. So in general, like I my, my life here is really comfortable and I've been here for seven years. I'm a permanent resident and initially I, I, I thought I would probably be here forever. <laughs> but now, you know, this there there's more to consider, you know, for my for my daughter. So I'm not really sure what's gonna happen in the future. But but yeah, I think life in Japan is, is really nice and even for foreigners it can be challenging. But you know, but I would say if you really like it here, you enjoy the culture, food, everything, you know, is 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 getting more diverse and I, I definitely feel like as foreigners we can still find our place here. Mm, cool. And maybe on that point about raising a child in Japan as a foreigner, yeah, you know, what what are your thoughts on that? Like, I, I don't know. Obviously, raising a child is difficult anywhere, but you know, especially in a foreign country. But yeah, what are your thoughts about um, you know raising a child here, and obviously the future in terms of you know if you want to stay here versus you know go somewhere else? What are yeah? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, raising a, a child here is is very nice. I mean, for actually other prefectures might be different, but at least in Tokyo. For um, children, since they are born uh, until they are 15, I think, um, healthcare is free. So we don't we don't need to pay anything when we take our you know our kid to the doctor to get medicine. Everything is free. I really like that. I feel like something the U.S. maybe needs to learn from. <laughs> and uh, and yeah and. Speaking about the U.S., there are still a lot of opportunities there for children. You know, there's so much uh, kids can do outdoor and, you know, it's bigger. Everything's kind of bigger in the U.S. And uh, for me, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I, I'm trying to decide what to do because, you know, it's safe here. But in terms of opportunities, my husband and I kind of feel like our daughters can do much more. In the U.S., they are, you know, kids, they are pretty happy. And, you know, in terms of school, too, the U.S. education system seems to be much more flexible and really allow the kids to be creative. While in Japan, it can be, um, you know, there's some limitations here, I feel like. So, yeah, so for my daughter's um, kind of education, perhaps we will move. But I'm not sure yet. Still debating. Mm. Yeah, because personally, my husband and I, we really like, we really like yeah. it here. Yeah. Do you think do you think she could have an advantage? Like say she grew up here speaking like in sorry, in Tokyo speaking both English and Japanese. And then she obviously say she moved overseas for university or worked overseas for a little bit and then came back. Do, was that not a big advantage, do you think, in, in Japan? I would say so. Yeah. I mean, you know, like like you say, you know, if she speaks Japanese from such early age and she knows the culture and everything, that would be a big advantage for sure. Yeah, so for us, it's really 
um, if we move, it will be just because school, you know, more options there and mm-hmm. things like that. But if we stay, I think for her, it's still, it's still pretty, pretty nice, you know, to be able mm-hmm. to live in this country where they are, you know, to us, we see all the good things too. And we want her to experience all the good things about yeah. Japan as well. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. And finally, in terms of, well, second last question. So in terms of your future plans, Obviously, obviously, you're not sure yet, but, you know, in, in, say, in the next five years or so forth, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to do? Um, obviously, raising your family is obviously um, the top priority, like it should be for everyone else. Um, but, yeah, what, what, what else do you want to do? Um, you know, what, what are your goals and, you know, plans over the next five to ten years? Yeah, so right now, you know, other than my responsibilities to my family, I'm working as a freelancer, doing Thailand sourcing for my clients. And, you know, with this job, you know, the long term goal is really for me to I feel like through working with my clients so closely, I can learn more about, you know, what was the priority for them when they when it comes to hiring. And I also want to be able to influence them a little bit. Right. Like in terms of okay, you know, culture is so important to me. And when I was pregnant, it was so difficult for me to find a job. So I gradually want to change the culture and make it, you know, easier for anybody from any background. So, you know, to me, diversity is really important and startups like to say they're diverse, right? But then Mm -hmm. sometimes they know that's still something they are, they have to work on. So I want to be able to work on that with them because, you know, through um, hiring, that's, you know, kind of a way to build towards that diversity i guess as we wrap out now in terms of people contacting you say they are listening to this podcast and want to contact you or whatever are you open to that like what's the best way to reach out to you yeah i mean this is really fun so yeah i'm happy to do more and if anybody want to reach out to me linkedin would be a good way because i'm always on linkedin (laughs) so yeah for sure cool so linkedin um yeah so yeah, find way on LinkedIn. <laughs> and, uh, find way yeah. on LinkedIn yeah. if you want to learn more or, you know, interested about getting a job in Japan. Is there anything I can help? So usually, even though I work with, you know, startup as clients, but I still talk to just candidates in general, see if I can help them find jobs. So, like, now I talk to, like, a couple of actually young Japanese. They are bilingual they are working for japanese companies big companies but they feel like the companies are really not utilizing their skills you know they are you know japanese but they were raised overseas so they, they think this is an advantage they want to use but they don't know how so i will kind of work with them and help them find jobs that will you know kind of allow them to be who they are <laughs> so okay, so yeah great. happy to talk to yeah. anyone Great. No, thanks for your chat today, Wei. Thanks for sticking through all the technical issues we've had so far. So I no, really appreciate it. I uh, really like your story. I think uh, people will find this useful in terms of, you know, uh, finding out if, you know, they, if they're trying to figure out if they, you know, can get a job in Japan, that, you know, it is possible. People like you, you know, your own story has shown that, you know, it is possible if you, if you put in a bit of work and effort. So I, yeah, just hopefully some people find it useful. So yeah, really appreciate your time today, Wei. And yeah, wish you all the best for the future and I'm sure we'll be in touch if I'm ever in Japan or whatever, so. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Yeah, make it, make, let me know when you're, you're here. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. Feel free to listen to the other clips and episodes on the channel and remember to subscribe and follow.